Hello everybody! I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. So I'm going to be picking up from where I left off last time. Today we're going to be talking about three main ideas. We're going to talk about something called Pascal's Triangle. And we're going to talk about the Binomial Theorem. And of course we're going to talk about probably one of the neatest of the counting techniques I'm going to show you called the Pigeonhole Principle. So as a process of this I'm going to show you another way you can argue um, the size of given sets uh, using something so called a uh, combinatorial argument. So let's get started. So, just to remind you from last day, an R combination is just going to be simply be a, be a if I give you a set A and it has n elements in it, an R combination is a subset of R of the elements from the set A. So just as a reminder, remember last time we talked about this, if I want all of the subsets of size R, meaning it has R elements in it, of A, then the number of these is N choose R, which is given by the formula I have here on the screen. So just this is the example I had from last day. So remember I had this example, I had four elements in A, so N is four. And I wanted to just show you what each R, remember R is the size of the subset for each one of our combinations. So for example, an R is zero, it's a zero combination or a subset of size zero. Or when R is one, it is a one combination, which is just a subset of A of size one. So it just picks one element from that and it's in the subset. So, and so on. So. You'll notice that I have this example and I went through this one the other day. Now, remember I told you to put this one fact in the back of your, just put it in your cap just so you can remember it for today because today we're going to talk about this. So you'll notice that there is a little bit of a symmetry going on in my example here. I want you to notice that when R is zero, you'll notice that the only subset I have is of course those of size zero, which is there's only one such subset, which is just the empty set. Likewise, when R is four, when R is four, you'll notice that I only have one subset. There's just the sub it's just the set itself, right? But you'll notice that there's a symmetry in the number of elements when R is one, there are four possible subsets, but also when R is three, you'll notice that there's also four subsets, right? I'm going to tell you that that is not just a coincidence. There's a very good reason why. So let's actually, uh, let me just illustrate this uh, out. And I'm just going to use the choose function or n choose r. I'm going to just show you what I mean by this symmetry. So I'm just going to calculate out these. So before I was showing you what the actual subsets are, I'm just going to use our formula here just to calculate out each one. I've color coded them here so you can see the mirror effect that's going on on the screen here. So you can see that when R is zero and R is four, you'll notice that four choose zero is actually equal to four choose four. Likewise, four choose one is equal to four choose three. And you'll notice that four choose two, choose two is like smack dab in the middle, but you'll notice that there's sort of a mirroring going on. Now, I want you to notice something. You'll notice that the formula that I have up there, just look over there, you'll see that that formula there has a sort of a symmetry built into the denominator. You'll notice that as R gets bigger, N minus R gets smaller, right? It gets smaller. So there's going to be some point where one of these is going to be where R factorial is zero and the other one will be N factorial. Then as I increase R, they're eventually going to meet at a some point, but then they're going to start literally calculating out the same numbers. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that is exactly by design. Um, so I'm going to talk about this. So let's let's actually prove this. So I'm going to use a so-called combinatorial argument to prove the following combinatorial identity. So we call it a combinatorial identity because you can derive it's it's a description of a combinatorial object or or counting things. So a combinatorial identity refers to an identity that involves counting objects. Um, and typically they're derived through combinatorial arguments. They don't have to, but typically they involve counting. So I give you n and r, and these are non-negative integers where r is less than or equal to n. n choose r is actually going to be equal to 
n choose n minus r. So that's what we're going to prove here. So just to give you a little bit of a heads up, if you actually wanted to prove this algebraically, what you can do is you could just start on the left hand side and you could just algebraically use the formula I have right here and then get to about an intermediate step somewhere right about where you've uh, where you've written out this formula and then you start go to the right hand side and you'll notice that if you write out that same formula you can actually rearrange it and you end up with the exact same formula it's not very complicated it's either that or if you really really wanted to you can always actually even derive it just from the left hand side just using algebra so just I would recommend just doing a strict algebra from left hand side to right hand side it's very simple um, if you just are very careful you're going to see that you have to be very careful when you're dealing with factorials but I want to show you this other approach so remember I have a set a so I'm just gonna call it a and I know that a has n elements in it what I want to do is remember what that what those identities up there say n choose r is the number of subsets of size r from the set a and n choose n minus r is the set of subsets of size n minus r from the set a so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try my best to create a subset i'm going to call b and I want to show you that any subset of B actually has a corresponding subset that's in another set such that both both my subsets when I take them together and I take all possible ones together I end up with A so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to imagine I give you some subset called B and this B is going to have a size of R. So like kind of look at the left hand side of my what I want to prove. So that's going to represent that identity. That's what the definition says, right? It is a subset of size R and I want all possible ones. So once that's going to consist of all of these R combinations of uh, uh, for the set A, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have another set on the other side. You'll notice that I have this other set where it's A minus B, which is, of course, another subset of A, of course, by just sheer set theory here. Now, if you'll notice that actually the, the, there's one slight error there. It should say A minus B for the cardinality there is N minus R. Um, because remember, we know the difference rule, right? So that's what the difference rule would tell you. Because remember, that's a subset on the other side there. B is a subset. So that's a small typo. I'll fix that when you look at the slides. So anyways, the point is, is that I can take these two sets, the sets of all R combinations of A and all the, the R, the R, sorry, N minus R combinations that are just simply the complement of each one of those subsets that I've given you. I take these together, I end up with A. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look and try to match these up by counting one side, counting the other side, and then looking at what they actually are from a combinatorial standpoint. And then, hey, look, if they match up, that means they must be equal in terms of their size. I've used this argument actually in the past when I was doing that mathematical induction proof for the size of a power set. So here's the idea. So suppose A has K subsets of size R. I'm going to list them out. B1, sub B2, sub B3, all the way up to B sub K. So those are all the subsets of size R of A. Then each one of these subsets can be paired with exactly one set that is A set difference, B sub I, which of course is some subset of A minus B. But notice that a minus b sub i is of course going to be equal to n minus r right so 
Let's think about this. So, you'll see how I have this laid out here. I've got a set of all possible k subsets of uh, sorry, all I have I have k subsets of size r on the left hand side, and then I have each one of these for each one of those subsets because that's all of them, right? That's all of the subsets of size r. For each one of those, I can give you another subset of a, which is a subset, of course, of a minus b by just simply taking its complement. So I take a minus that subset and I end up with another subset that is not in the other one. It's not in this one on the left, the set on the left hand side. It's in the set on the right hand side. So that being said, all you have to do is just count up the number of elements. Okay. So on the left hand side, since I've paired up each one with another element on the right hand side, You'll notice that the number of subsets of size R in A, um, when I pick out the ones of size R, that's just N choose R, right? And how about the ones on the right hand side? Well, that's all the number of subsets of size N minus R, which is of course is just N choose N minus R, right? So I've, I've showed you how you can pair them up. We'll talk more about this idea actually next class. But here's ultimately the argument. This is actually how you would prove this in a combinatorial fashion. So if you took a combinatorics class, this would be naturally how you would do it. So you could, the argument generally boils down to deciding which R objects to select from a set of N objects is actually the same as deciding which N minus R objects not to select. So if I give you N minus R objects not to select, I'm really just telling you the R objects, right? But if I don't want to select those, remember, there's a certain number of these subsets, right? But ultimately, I'm telling you that there's a way you can always go from one to the other. Just taking the complement does it. So if I have these two identities in play, one for one set and one for the other set, remember, these two sets are disjoint from one another. So if I wanted to, so it's worth noting that these are two disjoint sets. And when I take them together, I want you to notice that that ultimately you end up with, hey, look, this is just simply just the identity that I'm trying to prove, right? <laughs> Hence, you end up with the conclusion of being this uh, the set uh, the set identity I have up here at the top. So that's ultimately where the proof goes with this. So. If you're wondering where this comes from, you can argue it in a combinatorial fashion like this by splitting up A into those that that are of size, well, the, all the subsets of size R, and then I take all the ones that are of subsets of size N minus R, and then I show that you can actually pair them up. And then, hey, look, if they match in terms of their size on one side and their size on the other side, I'm just invoking their combinatorial identities for counting up each one. They must be equal. So hopefully you understand that. I'm going to show you another example of using this kind of argument. Now, it should be very clear here. Remember that this is B is some subset where the cardinality of B is equal to R. So it's worth noting that that it, that that these other ones the ones that are in this other side of this set they are those that are of subset of size n minus r so i should just clarify that for full sake just because this diagram it makes it look a little bit misleading like i'm literally giving you every single one which is not necessarily the case remember i'm only caring about the subsets of size r so i'm just partitioning a so only the parts that are relevant, okay? So just to clarify that. So that brings me to talking about the idea of Pascal's triangle. So I've given you a, a, a combinatorial identity that gives you a simple way to calculate each one of our N choose R cases here. So I'm going to draw them out like this. And I'm going to use color coding to help you see how I can calculate out these values a little bit faster. 
So zero choose zero. Well, if you just use the def, use the formula that I gave you, it's just one. Um, now I'm gonna put. Now it's worth noting that some people will define whenever r becomes bigger than n. Sometimes they make it zero, but for our purposes, we're not really gonna care about that. Um, we don't really need that, and our definition doesn't actually have that in it. So, anyways, let's go to the next row here. So row number one. So we have row number one. So row number one, you'll notice that one choose zero, well, that's just one, right? <laughs> because you'll notice whenever I have a choose zero, you'll notice that it's the number factorial divided by the number itself factorial multiplied by itself minus zero factorial in parentheses. Um, so you end up with just, just this, uh, with, with nothing terribly interesting going on. Actually, let me see here. This is actually a small typo here. This, my apologies here. I'll catch this one again here. So that should be a zero right here. There should be a zero right there. That should be a zero fact. Because remember, that's not a, that's a part of a formula. This is zero factorial times one minus zero factorial. So my apologies. Another small typo. My apologies. Unless everywhere else, you'll notice that this follows quite nicely. So every time you see a zero in the bottom of the choose function, so you have n choose zero, and so on for any n um, that's such that we've defined it. You'll notice that it'll always be n factorial over r factorial, which is zero factorial, which is just one, and then you end up with n minus zero factorial, which is just n factorial. So you have n factorial over n factorial, which is just one. So you'll notice if, right away if you look at this first column here, the one for when r is zero, this one right here, that one, you know that that column is just going to have always entries with one in it. So because of the theorem that I just showed you, you notice that whenever I get to the up to the number that matches n, it should also equal one. So by the theorem that I gave you before, if I have n choose r, I know that n choose n minus r is going to be the same. So if I have one choose zero, then one choose one minus one should in fact be one choose zero, right? But the thing is, that's just one choose one, right? Because of the theorem. So that's also one. So you can do the same principle here on the second row. So you'll notice that, that here I have two choose zero, that's just one. Remember that tells you what should be sitting over here for r is two because of the combinatorial identity I just proved with you. And then we just have this middle entry. You just calculate that out. So just calculate this one out using the formula and you end up with two. Now I'll give you another tip here. Any entry that is where r is one, you'll end up just being n. The way you can notice this is because when our formula, it'll be n n factorial over one factorial minus n minus one factorial. But when you expand this out, you'll realize that that's n factorial over n minus one factorial. And what's n factorial? It's n times n minus one factorial. So you have an n minus one factorial in the top and you have an n minus one factorial in the bottom. You could cancel those out and you end up with just n on the top. So if you're ever looking at this first column and how to look at this table, just put in the number, just put in what n is. So that brings me to talking about, so, so that's a very easy way you can determine that column. So now we're going to talk about when we get to, get to when we have n is, when we get n is three, you'll notice that I have the same symmetry playing around here. So same idea as before. Likewise, the same thing before for row four. But I want you to observe something that's very fascinating here. Now, I want you to see something that's kind of neat about this. I want you to observe something, and I'm going to show you it more generally in a moment here. So you'll notice if I pick out this element two here, notice that that is just one plus one, right? Well, 
what's sitting directly above it is a 1, and what's directly to its up and then to its left? Well, there's 1 right here. Notice that also that if I look at, say, this entry here, where 4 choose 2, you'll notice that directly above it is a 3, and to its top left, right here, it's also a 3. So notice if I take 3 plus 3, I get 6. It's very strange. So let me draw this out a little bit more generally. So here's just an expanded version of Pascal's triangle. So that's what Pascal's triangle is, is this, the, you'll notice it looks it's shaped like a triangle. You can draw this out in nice ways than this. Just I find this makes it a little easier to calculate out the values. So notice I've written out the general formulas for each one of the rows and columns up to N and R. So for example, when I look at the column when it's R and when it's N, you'll see that it's N choose R right here. And the row directly below it is when N is plus N plus one. And I have R is, is well, R is R, right? <laughs> so it's, it's N plus one choose R. Now, I wanted to show you this. So, hey, look, look, this, this seems awfully strained, right? Like I can take these two right here, and I can add that, and I get the, the one directly below the one, right? I could do the same thing here. So notice I have 6 plus 4 is equal to 10, right? So if ever I know entries above the entry I'm interested to, and the one that's the direct left above it, you'll notice that that will actually be able to, it looks like, at least looks like, it actually will be able to tell me what that entry is supposed to be, which is very interesting. There's, this is the interesting part. Notice that if I slide kind of my Tetris piece, it looks kind of like a Tetris piece, I slide it over and you'll notice right here that this actually tells me something about the relationship of these choose functions. And this gives, so this gives me the idea that I want to show you next. So this is actually a direct relationship in play. So this is what we call Pascal's formula. So if I give you two positive integers n and r, where r is less or equal to n, then n plus 1 choose r is equal to n choose r minus 1 plus n choose r. So you can look at this almost like a recursive definition in some aspects, yes, because it's defined in terms of earlier entries in Pascal's triangle or in my table. So I'm going to show you another combinatorial argument here. So, imagine I have n and r, where r is less than or equal to n. Now, what I want to do is I want to suppose that I have some set S, and it has n plus 1 elements in it. And I'm going to list out those elements. It's going to be a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to a sub n, to n, a sub n plus 1. So, what I want to do is I want to consider all possible subsets of s of size r. I'm just going to call it r to make this a little easier for myself. I don't really have to do that, but I'm just going to do it anyway just to make it a little easier so you have a name to attach to it. Like, my proof doesn't really require it. Actually, I was just looking a little ahead. I don't technically need that sentence. I'm just putting it there for your... just to help you out here. So, Notice that if I give you any subset of size R, it either has to contain, it's either one or two possibilities. Either it's going to have A sub N plus 1 or it does not. This should look very familiar to you in terms of the arguments that we've been using kind of in, in the past. I used an argument very similar to this one actually in the past when I was actually proving the size of the power set. When we are still talking about set theory. I'm going to use an argument very similar to this. So... So I have, so I'm going to have a set of all of the subsets of S of size R. So there's going to be two possible kinds of subsets. There's those that contain A sub N plus 1, and then there's the ones that do not. So we have two possibilities. We have the subsets that contain A sub N plus 1. Those ones have R minus 1 elements that are from the set A sub 1, A sub 2, all the way up to A sub N. So, remember, how many of those are there? Well, remember, I have n elements from my set here of all those, 
R minus one elements. Because I imagine I have, I give you a set, and I already know that A sub N plus one is going to be something I'm going to just tack on to it. So whenever I give you any subset, I'm just going to put A sub N plus one on it. Just like imagine like a sticky note. I'm just going to stick it on there. So that information is completely irrelevant to how I count it. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the subset with a, a sub n plus 1. All of them have this. So if I actually want to look at the number of distinct subsets of size r minus 1, I can get all the ones of size r by just simply sticking on like a, like a little post-it note a sub n plus 1. But how many of these are there? Okay, well, there's R minus one elements I'm selecting from, because remember, I've already determined one of them. It's going to always be this uh, A sub N plus one. But at the same time, I've taken away one option from you. You can think of it almost like my example where I imagine I have a whole bunch of spots. I have, imagine I have N plus one spots, and I've told you, hey, look, the N plus one spot is going to go right to A sub N plus one. So how many am I going to have left? I'm going to have n spots, sorry, n elements that I'm going to have that I can use, but I'm going to have to fill r minus 1 positions because the one of those positions is going to a sub n plus 1. But how many of those are there? There's n choose r minus 1 of these, right? Because I've reserved one position for a sub n plus 1, and I've thus chosen it. So. So just remember, just think of it, I'm just going to take that set, a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to a sub n, and I want to choose r minus 1 elements from it. But whenever I determine that, I can just slap on a sub n plus 1, and that will give me these, these subsets. All of these subsets look like this. However, the other case is where it does not contain a sub n plus 1 at all. So... These ones consist entirely of elements from a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to a sub n, but not a sub n plus 1. So it means I've not reserved a spot for a sub n plus 1, thus there are n choose r possible such subsets. Well, okay, well what, what are the number of subsets of a set with n plus 1 elements? Well. If I want to have all the ones of size R, well, that's just N plus 1, choose R, right? That's that's what we've established and used in the past. Therefore, remember, I've shown you, I, I'm looking at R. So remember, R right here is the set of all subsets of, of S of size R. So I'm going to partition R into two possible subsets. Those that consist of the subsets of A, of S, sorry, of S, that fall into this first case. And then I'm going to have the other subset of all possible subsets that is going to consist of these ones. So if I take the union of these two subsets of S, I should get back S, and they're disjoint from each other. So the pairwise disjoint. So that means I can use the addition rule that I showed you last class, which says, okay, if I know it's the total number of these is, is N plus one choose R, and I've told you I can break the set into two pieces. So I've split them into two disjoint sets, such that if I union them back together, I get back all the possible subsets of size R, right? And guess what? Those are our two identities that I've derived for you in these two different cases. And thus, we're finished. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some neat things you can talk about with Pascal's Triangle. There's tons of things you can do with Pascal's triangle. But here's a couple of things I'll point out to you that are kind of neat about it. So the first thing I'll point out is that if you take roughly, if you take a so this is another way of drawing Pascal's triangle out. Um, so you'll notice that if I take sort of a shallow diagonal of each one of these, so let me just kind of stick in line with this. If I take a shallow diagonal, if I just start drawing lines like I've done here, if I add up the numbers that sit on this shallow diagonal, they end up looking like the Fibonacci sequence, which is very fascinating in its own right. So I, if you don't recall, the Fibonacci sequence is where you have a number. So every number in its sequence is determined by the previous two entries, where the first initial two terms are defined as 1 and 1. 
So you end up with one, one. Okay, well, two, sorry, the next sequence is just going to be one plus one, which is just two. Well, what are the two previous ones for the next number? Well, it's two plus one, which is three. Okay, what are the two previous terms for the next term? Okay, three plus two, which is just five. What are the two previous terms? Okay, they're three plus five, which is just eight, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can actually use Pascal's triangle to derive out the, the Fibonacci numbers. And so this is one way you can actually derive actually another formula for the Fibonacci sequence. So for every one of these terms, you can actually get this using the choose functions. I won't give you the actual formula, I'll let you think about it, uh, but keep in mind, it, this is just an interesting fact about the fa about Pascal's triangle. Here's another one. Actually, there, here's a few, to be honest with you. Okay, so I already established a couple of these, so a couple of these in the past actually with you, but you just don't know it yet. <laughs> so, so the first thing is, remember that I told you that the first column, which in this triangle, you'll notice that actually I've shifted everything towards the middle. So actually it looks like the, the columns are actually on a slant kind of like this. Um, so, I mean, sorry, it'll be like this, like this. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at my camera to make sure I'm not doing it in the wrong direction. So you'll notice I color coded these to help you see what orientation I'm talking about. So you'll notice, remember I told you that if I want to look at the first column, I already know how to fill those in. Remember, those are just n choose one, which those end up just being n. So that I end up with just positive integers. Then look at the next one. I want you to observe that there's the triangle numbers there. There's a couple other sequences in here that I haven't told you about. I just gave you links in the slides here if you're curious more about these. Um, they, they're interesting in their own right. Just they're not quite relevant for this course as much. I just thought I would throw them in there anyways. But here's an interesting thing I want to show you, and it's going to come up later, and it's something I've been alluding to for quite some time, actually. Just you don't know it yet. You might know it if you're very clever. So you'll notice that if I take each one of these rows here, if I try adding up the numbers in each one of these rows, so the first one has 1 in it. If I sum up the second row here, it's 1 plus 1, which is 2. The third row is 1 plus 2 plus 1, which is 4. Then the fourth row is 1 plus 3, which is 4. Then, then we have another 3 plus 1, which is just 4, and that's 8. Notice that each one of these rows actually adds up to a power of 2. And I want you to keep in the back of your mind the thing I showed you at the beginning of the class. Think power set. Just think power set. Now, I want to just emphasize that this is not black magic. So... You can show that shallow diagonal property of, for the Fibonacci numbers. You can use mathematical induction to do this. So you just need weak induction to actually achieve it. So I want to focus on this, this one particular part here, the triangle numbers. So I want you to notice that if I go back to my previous slide over here, those triangle numbers are actually occurring in the column where I have R is 2. So everywhere where R2 is happening, that's where that sequence is occurring. So I'm going to show you actually how you get the triangle numbers. So what I'm going to do is, um, is I'm just going to assume that I'm going to take a, make sure that n plus 1 is greater than 2. I'm going to use n plus 1 because it makes it look a little prettier. I'm just going to think about it like I'm going to calculate the next row below it. Like I could do it technically where it's n, but I find it's not as pretty looking. So I'm going to also do it because of the way we define Pascal's formula. Now keep in mind you can easily calculate this out uh, algebraically, but I want to show you how you can use Pascal's formula. So, so I'm going to try to calculate n plus 1 choose 2. Well, Pascal's formula tells me that this is n choose 1 plus n choose 2. Okay, well, n choose 1 is just n, right? Remember we established that if I give you anything that's choose 1, it's just going to be n, right? So that's going to be n. Okay, what's n choose 2? Okay, well, it's n factorial over 2 factorial times all in the denominator. Together, it's n minus 2 factorial. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how you could simplify this. So on the next step, you're just going to expand out the factorial on the top. So you're just going to take n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 factorial. I'm just going to make it so that the factorial gets expanded out just enough so I can cancel it out on the bottom. 
That's going to be a very common algebraic trick you will use when manipul manipulating a factorial. So, you'll notice I can cancel at the end minus two factorials. And then I end up with, uh, I'm going to try to make a common denominator. So I end up with 2n plus n squared times, sorry, minus n. Because remember, I just have at the top, I'll just end up with n times n minus 1. So that just turns into n squared minus n. And then I'm going to simplify this a little bit. You'll notice that I end up with one extra n to play around with. So I end up with n squared plus n over 2. And thus, I'm just going to factor and I end up with n times n plus 1 over 2. And that's the definition of a triangle number, right? So there it is. No black magic here. Everything here has a reason for it existing. And it's all thanks to this Pascal's triangle, the way we can organize out all these combinatorial identities. It's very celebrated result in combinatorics. Now, that brings me to the next stage in our discussion. So that's all my discussion on Pascal's triangle. There's so many things I can talk about with Pascal's triangle. It's a very fascinating subject. Um, I'm going to switch gears to talk about the binomial theorem. Now, you may have heard of this theorem before, but I'm going to anyway introduce it to you in a combinatorial way. So first, a binomial is a polynomial that is the sum of two terms. I'm literally going to read it from you because I think this is a simple enough definition. So for example, if I give you two real numbers, a and b, and a non-negative integer, n, I'm going to say that n, a plus b is a polynomial. Uh, sorry, not a polynomial, a binomial. So uh, this is in contrast to just being a and b, which are called monom uh, mononomials. So... And what I want to do is I want to explore different powers of a pi of a binomial. So imagine I give you a plus n together raised to the power of n. So I'm going to first try out the first set of these numbers for when we we're just going to start off actually with one technically zero you just end up with one but it's not that's not terribly interesting. Um, but the point I'm getting at is that I have a plus b to the power 1. Well, that's just a plus b, which is just a plus b, right? There's nothing too fascinating here. Okay, how about if we consider when a plus 1, sorry, a plus b is squared. Okay, well, that's a plus b multiplied by a plus b, right? Okay, well, in this, in this way, you would normally use what some people call the FOIL method. Um, but... I want you to actually think about this a little bit differently. Um, and you'll find that this rule will actually work a lot easier for you once you see it, if you don't know this trick. And this is typically how you actually calculate it out. So if I give you some element a in the first pair, I have to multiply it by this other pair, this uh, each element in the other pair. So I have to multiply a by a and a by b. Then I have to multiply a Sorry, multiply b by a, and then I have to multiply b by b. So there's four multiplications I have to do here. So I end up with what I have here, where I have a times a plus a times b times plus b times a plus b times b. So you can apply, you can generalize this whole idea to maybe when we talk about cubes. So if I take it, I want to raise this to the power of three. Unless I can use the same principle. Okay, I have a, I need to multiply it by a, and I need to multiply it by a. Okay, a needs to be multiplied by a again, possibly, and then I have to multiply it by b. So I'm just going to do all possible ways I can multiply out these three terms together. So when I do this, so I do all possible combinations of each one of the elements in their pairs. You'll notice I get a times a times a plus a times a times uh, b times a plus a times b times b plus b times a plus times a plus b times a plus I'm sorry times b plus b times b times a plus b times b times b. Now this looks like a mouthful. So I'm going to go to the next one, and I want you to notice that we're starting to see a little bit of an interesting pattern here. Um, you'll notice that really what I'm doing every single time I do this is I'm just simply taking whatever's in the previous step. So I have, so notice I have a, all of these here. I want you to look at all of the first, I want to look at the first four of these. 
Do you really see something interesting here? You'll notice that really, all of these four here, if aside from the A that's sitting out in front, they all look identical to the ones directly above it, right? We have an A and an A, then you have an A and a B, then we have a B and an A, and then we have a B and a B. I've done is just tacked A on it. Now notice that the other remaining ones are just the exact same pattern again, right? Except I've just put a B at the front, right? Just the B is sitting here at the front. This should look eerily similar to you. You'll see why in a bit. <laughs> You'll see why in a bit. So let's proceed to the fourth power. So I'm going to refer to each one of these as a factor. So instead of talking about these as bi uh, binomial pairs, I'm going to refer to them as factors. So notice that when I have three factors, I end up with multiplying out three terms. And I have all the combinations of these three possible factors being multiplied out of each binomial. So when I have four of them like this, naturally you're going to think, okay, well, if there's four factors. That means I'm going to have to multiply out four, four, I'm going to have a combination of four of them in a row. And I'm going to have to consider all possible combinations of these. And I end up with this. Does this look eerily similar to you? Well, look at this. That's all here. That's A. So notice that this pattern is literally sitting right here. Just I tacked A in front of it. And then really it's the same pattern again, except I tacked B in front of it. So I want you to just keep that in the back of your mind. I, I, I swear, I'm, I'm not trying to lead you on too much, but just keep that in the back of your mind. It's a very simple way of remembering how this pattern works. So if you ever forget how to do the FOIL method or factoring things, you can actually use this type of strategy to multiply out all these terms and then simplify. So this is the general way you can actually do it. So if you're really intimidated by large factors, this is a systematic way of doing it. So remember, you just consider you were going to multiply each possible combination of all of all of the terms within respective pairs. So just look at the pattern I have here. Well, well, now, now this is where it gets interesting. Okay. You'll realize that when I multiplied out all of these terms, that really I'm repeating a lot of these over and over and over again. So they're really going to fall into five cases. Five cases. Notice that I have four terms that are getting multiplied out because I have four factors. So either it's going to have an A in it or a B in it for each one of these spots of the four. So I'm going to have, for the first case, four A's and zero B's. So if I wrote this out algebraically, this would, a, this would be A to the power of four times B to the zero. Because remember, integer raised to zero is just one. And all of these will look like A, 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 right? But if I consider... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all those terms I've set sitting up here. I'm just going to group them up. And I want you to see something that's rather interesting here. This should look very familiar to you. I've just drawn it in a way that looks very strange um, at first. And then the minute you see it, it'll click very quickly. Okay. If I have three A's and one B, notice that these are all the possible ways. So these are all the terms up above that consist of three A's and one B. Then in the third case, I have two A's and two B's. These are all the possible terms that I have up there with two A's and two B's in them and so on. So I have all five of these cases, but I want you to look at the number of terms that are of this form. So the first case I have one, the second case I have four, the third case I have six, the fourth case I have four again, and then I have one. We seen this earlier. Isn't that interesting? What is that? What is that? What is that? that, that that's interesting. I swear I've seen this before. Um, well, look at it. Look at it. It's right there. Okay. Remember, we actually calculated this out earlier on in the lecture. It's right here, right? It's four choose zero, and then four choose one, four choose two, four choose three, and four choose four. So, 
if I wanted to calculate out a plus b raised to the power of 4, you'll notice that if I group all of my terms into these simplified forms by associative and commutative laws of algebra, I can write out all of the terms using these choose functions or and for each one of these. So I have 4 choose 0, 4 choose 1, 4 choose 2, 4 choose 3, and 4 choose 4. For each one of my cases, I had five of them. So when I simplify this out, I end up with what I have down here for the expansion. Isn't that neat? So so if, if you're wondering where this goes, so you'll notice that I've given you an actually a very interesting pattern here. So notice I have four factors, and now I end up with four, choose zero, four, choose one, four, choose two, and, and I have for each one of the cases, but notice that each time, a starts going down by one every single time and B goes up by one. So they eventually meet up in the middle and they eventually correspond like this. Now remember, because of the symmetry that we know, because of the combinatorial identity, you notice that I could technically have considered the B's as A's and the A's as B's. It doesn't really matter, which is very interesting. This brings me to a general formula for this. This is called the binomial theorem. So you may have seen this before. So if I give you two real numbers, a and b, and just some non-negative integer, if I give you, give you a plus b to the power of n, it's equal to the sum from k is zero to n of n choose k multiplied by a raised to the power of n minus k times b to the k. Remember, all that's in, that's all a part of the summation. So you can actually prove this with mathematical induction. Um, so the one trick I will mention if you ever wanted to prove this is use Pascal's formula. In the inductive step, you'll probably need Pascal's formula. There's a point where you'll naturally want to jump from one rung to the next rung for your inductive step. But guess what? I told you how you can calculate from one smaller n to the n plus 1, right? Well, you can use Pascal's formula to do that. So instead, I'm just going to give you a combinatorial idea. Now, this one's somewhat more restrictive, the argument, in the sense that it doesn't work for when it's zero, uh, when n is zero. Um, so, but I, I want to show it to you anyways. So if I give you each k, so I have k is zero, k is one, k is two, all the way up to n. If I write out the product of a to the power of n minus k times b to the k, if I write out those terms that number of times, I end up with n minus k factors for the a's and I end up with k factors for the, for the b's. Well, imagine I have n positions, because remember, if I take up and add all of these positions, because remember, there are n factors here, because n, remember, n is the number of factors, just like when I have four, like a plus b to the power of 4, I had four factors. If I take the n minus k plus the k, I end up with n, right? Well, that means that there's n positions to put n minus k a's and k positions for, sorry, and then there's, so k of those, of those n positions need to go for the b's. Well, I'm just going to pick one of the two. So I'm just going, because remember, of the symmetry, remember, I talked about the symmetry of Pascal's uh, Pascal's uh, triangle, which ends up being that combinatorial identity. I'm just going to pick the B's. Well, notice that if I wanted to count up the number of subsets that determine n positions, so if I give you n positions that I can pick from, I want to put k of these to be B's. Well, that's just that's just, I'm just, I, I want k of those to be occupied by b, so that's just n choose k, right? So that's the way I can choose k positions to place the b's in. Now remember, if I know where all the positions of the b's go, then all the a's can just fill in those other positions. It doesn't matter. Just like I said, by, by the same, arg same token and argument, you could say that it also equals n choose n minus k, but we already established that that's also equal to n choose k. So that being said, that's one other way you can go about trying to show the binomial theorem is true.
So you just simply do this over all the Ks, and you end up with that summation that's sitting up there at the top. So it's worth noting that n choose k, so I've called it the choose function, I've also called it n choose k. Um, it's also sometimes called the binomial coefficient because it appears in all my binomials here and as a part of the binomial theorem. It's the coefficient that appears in the theorem. So sometimes people call, refer to it as a binomial coefficient. So just keep that in mind. That's just another name for it. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can use the binomial theorem. So imagine I gave you a very complicated looking formula like I have here. Like this, actually, it's not really a formula, it's just a an expression. I want you to simplify for me the sum from k is 0 to n of n choose k multiplied by 9 to the k. Looks very complicated. Now remember, whenever I give you a number 1, if I give you 1 and I raise it to any power, it's just 1. So I'm just going to use a little bit of, of my Dan my Dan combinatorial magic here. It's not magic. It's just it's just neat knowledge. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take what I have here and I'm just going to insert in what looks like the form of the binomial theorem. So I'm going to say so by the binomial theorem. You'll notice I can rewrite the summation where I can insert in 1 to the n minus k into this, which is matches the form of the binomial theorem. So what does that mean? Well, okay, if you look at a and b, well, a is going to be 1 and b is going to be 9. Thus, this equals 1 plus 9 together raised to the power of n, which is equal to, of course, 10 to the n. And we're done. Is that neat? So you can use the binomial theorem to simplify expressions like this quite a bit. Now, this brings me to my most interesting point I have for you. So I'm going to first show you how you can derive this relationship using the binomial theorem, which is dead easy. Once you have the binomial theorem at your disposal, you'll be like, Dan, why didn't you show me this from the first place? After I show you this, <laughs> it's because I, I, you really need to see and appreciate how to do it without these combinatorial arguments. So first, uh, I'm going to show you that two to the power of n is equal to the sum from k is equal to zero to n of n choose k. And this is true for n greater or equal to 0, where n is an integer. So now remember, 2 is equal to 1 plus 1, right? I sure hope that that's acceptable at this stage, that 1 plus 1 equals 2. In this class, we're going to accept that that's okay. Um, then we know that 2 to the power of n is just going to be equal to 1 plus 1 to the n, right? Therefore, by the binomial theorem, when I make a is 1 and b is 1, I can invoke the binomial theorem which so to the power of n is going to be equal to the sum from k is equal to 0 to n of n choose k, where each one of my a's and b's are now 1. But remember, 1 is 1 raised to anything. Uh, at least when we're talking about the exponents we're dealing with. It's always 1, right? So that's, those are just going to simplify down to 1. And thus, 1 times the choose function or the binomial coefficient it's just going to be the binomial coefficient, and thus we end up with the summation. So therefore, 2 to the power of n is equal to the sum from k is equal to 0 to n of n choose k. So that's one way you can derive this. I'm going to show you another way you can derive this. And it's going to give you a whole other way of looking at this formula. And you're going to see that really this is just eerily me showing you the exact same thing I've been trying to hit in for the past couple of weeks when we talk about things like the power set. And why the power set is very interesting. So we've actually seen this result in the past. Just I've shown you a, a way doing it by induction. So look at the sum I have there. If you take a combinatorial view of this, I'm taking the sum of the number of subsets of size 0, the number of subsets of size 1, the number of subsets of size 2, all the way up to the sum of subsets of size n. That's what the summation means that I have up here. Well, let's think about this in terms of objects. Well, if I give you a set of n elements and I call it a, well, what's the union of all the subsets of size 0 of a? Well, those are all the 0 combinations of a. Okay, how about all the subsets of size 1 of A? Well, those are all the 1 combinations of A, and so on, and so on. 
And I take the union of all of them. Well, what did I tell you earlier? I told you that this is the power set. This is, these are all possible subsets of A, right? Because I've considered all possibilities. I've started at the ones of size 0, and I went all the way up to the ones of size N. And, of course, the cardinality of A is N. So if I take the union of all these, that's just the power set. Thus, the cardinality of the power set is just equal to this summation, which is equal to 2 to the power of N. Is that interesting? So... If you actually think about this very carefully, just think about this. This should look eerily similar to you. Just a lot of these things I've been showing you are eerily similar. I'm just showing you another perspective of how you can derive the formula for the number of elements in the power set. So you can derive it in a way that looks like our induction proof that I showed you the other week. You can use the binomial theorem, but the binomial theorem ultimately is using this idea under the hood. So it's really, if you think about it in terms of the actual objects and counting them, we're really just constructing the power set. And I'm just using bits and pieces to combine them. And remember, each one of these numbers of subsets, which correspond to a subset of A, which are so each one of these are subsets of A. When I put them all together, that's some subset of the power set of A. So if I take the union of each one of those, I end up with a power set of A. And they're all disjoint from one another. They're all pairwise disjoint. So you can actually derive this using the addition rule. So that's just a side point. So hopefully this gives you a very interesting way of viewing this. So one last thing I want to talk about today and this is one of the neater ones I'm going to show you in this whole area. I promise the last subject is going, the last topic we're going to talk about is, I would argue is also very fascinating, like this one. We're going to talk about the pigeonhole principle. So I'm going to first give you the formal way of talking about the pigeonhole principle. Then I'll give you more of a way that combinatorics people tend to use this very often. Or people that really like counting or want to talk about concrete objects. So if I give you a function f, where the domain is x and it has n elements in that set and I give you the codomain as y and it has m elements in it. If n is strictly bigger than m, then f is not bijective. So just remember bijective means one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you look at my picture here, you'll notice that on x there I have five elements and because it's a function, there has to be an error. So this is my arrow diagram of this function. You'll notice that, there's no, that every one element in x has to have an arrow leaving it, right? Well, if there's less elements in y, in this case I have four elements, you'll notice that by, there's no real choice. There has to be at least one, one element in y that has two arrows pointing to it. So I'm going to give you, so that's one way of looking at this. If you think about it in terms of the arrow diagrams, so you can get very technical with this. So basically if I get the output of, uh, so if I look at the outputs of each element in X, you'll notice that there has to be at least one that will actually have it where it's, they match on the side of Y. So they'll end up, they'll end up having two elements where they're actually going to have the same output. There has to be at least one of such such element. So let me put in the way I like to talk about this. <laughs> so this is so this is a fun way of looking at it. So instead of thinking about it in terms of a function, which keep in mind this is still talking about a function, but I find this way is a very easy way of analogizing it. So if n pigeons are to be put into m pigeon holes, if n is bigger than m then at least one pigeonhole contains more than one pigeon. So it's worth noting for a historical standpoint that when people talk about the pigeonhole principle from a historical standpoint, we're technically talking mostly about letters going in mail slots. But I find it's a lot more fun to talk about literal pigeons and pigeonholes. So we're not talking about mail delivery here. <laughs> we're, I'm talking literally about pigeons. <laughs> So that's just a fun historical fact. If you go back a little bit, pigeonholes, that's referring to talk about mail. But um, so anyway, so instead of thinking about each element in X, like it's some element, just imagine you have pigeons. 
and the pigeons are going to fly into the pigeonholes. These are places where the pigeons are just going to hang out. So, what the pigeonhole principle tells you is that there, if there's more pigeons than there are pigeonholes, then there's going to have to be a pigeon that's going to have to go into a pigeonhole that already has a pigeon in it. So there's going to be two pigeons that are going to fly into the same pigeonhole. Just like my friend over here is like, hey, what's up here? Where's my hole? Because he doesn't have any more holes here. There's, there's now, now he has to occupy it with another pigeon, which kind of sucks. <laughs> so it's a very simple idea. I'm going to show you lots of examples of how to use this principle. So, so now if you really want to think about this, instead of thinking about pigeons, think about objects and think of pigeonholes as containers to put the objects in. Now, it's really important for you to notice here that, that remember, this is talking about a function, and the function maps elements from x to y, or pigeons to pigeonholes, or objects to containers. And remember, it's like, I'm not, I don't, I don't dictate how the pigeons fly into the pigeonholes. The point is, is that there's some, the pigeons are going to fly to some pigeonhole. That's the powerful thing here. So I don't dictate where the pigeons are going to go. This the point is, is strictly based on the number of elements, the number of pigeons I have, and the number of pigeon holes I have. There's going to have to be at least one of my pigeon holes or containers or elements in Y that's going to contain more than one pigeon or more than one object or have an output that is going to be Y for at least two elements of X. So anyways. Just to hammer in this idea, imagine I give you a group of 13 people. Believe it or not, the pigeonhole principle tells you that at least two people in the group are going to have the same month for their birthday. So here's how you do it. So you imagine you have one set. Our pigeons are going to be people. Now, literally, they're not pigeon people, I assure you. They are people. <laughs> so also, it's, not, it's kind of degrading to call them objects. <laughs> as well but uh so we're just gonna think so the people are just going to be x and y are going to be my birth months or the pigeon holes or the containers and i'm going to lump my people into birth months so i'm going to define a function p where each pi for a person is going to tell me my the birth month of that person well if you think about it i have 13 people and how many months are there in a year? At least with our calendar, there are 12 months in a year, right? So that means no matter how I decide my, my people's birthdays, keep in mind, I don't actually dictate it. Uh, they can be arbitrary. <laughs> um, I'm just doing it for hypothetical sense. So imagine I get, as I, each one of these people had an assigned birth month. Um, remember, like I said, I have no control over the time and how people get birthed. <laughs> this is just making it easier to talk about. <laughs> so if I give you each one of these people and each one has a birth month, remember, because it's a function, each one of these people has a birth month. So I know I have, if you think about like an arrow diagram, each one of those people is going to have an arrow pointing towards one of those months. But guess what? There are 13 arrows. So each one of those arrow points or tips or outputs of our functions, there, there's going to be one more person than number of months. So there's going to have to be, by the pigeonhole principle, at least two people that are going to have the same month for their birthday, which is kind of interesting. I'm going to rank this up a little bit further. I'm going to show you another trick that you can use with the pigeonhole principle. It's very often something you encounter when you're trying to add up elements and you want to find a neat way of counting or elaborating on them. Now, you're going to notice very quickly that this pigeonhole principle doesn't actually tell you how to construct them. It's more of a question of existence. So let me talk more about this and I'll elaborate a bit more what I mean by this. So if I give you a set A and it has numbers from 1 through 8, now, suppose I gave you five numbers you can pick from. They can be any five numbers, as long as they're from A. 
Is there, does, must there exist a pair of the five numbers that you pick that have a sum of nine? So you're allowed to pick any two numbers in that set um, from the five that you select. So you pick five numbers. Out of those five, there has to exist a pair of those five numbers that adds to nine. That is really what I'm saying. So for any five numbers you pick, must there exist a pair of those five numbers such that if I add them together, I get nine. So I want you to observe something that's very neat. So if I partition A into very specific subsets, and each of these are going to be disjoint, I'm going to carefully design the subsets such that each pair of elements in my subsets are going to add to nine. So notice that I have eight elements in my set. So I'm going to turn these into four disjoint subsets where each element is going to be paired up with the most outermost ones. And then I'm going to kind of work my way in. So I'm going to add one and eight. I'm going to put those into a subset. I'm going to take two and seven. I'm going to put those into a subset. I'm going to take three and six. I'm going to put those into a subset. And I'm going to put four and five and put those into a subset. So I end up with four subsets of partition A. So that's that's the intuition. This, this is the ingenuity when we're going to use the pigeonhole here. So here we go. So I've done this, but I want you to observe that every integer that you pick must appear exa in exactly one of the four subsets. So if I give you any integer out of the five I select from A, it's going to have to sit in one of those four subsets. So if I pick five numbers, well, notice this. I have five numbers I pick. And imagine C is the function that tells me which subset AI belongs to if I pick AI. Well, notice that, hey, look, I have four subsets and I have five numbers to pick from. So by the pigeonhole principle, I have five pigeons and I have four pigeonholes, thus ends up that there's going to always have to be such a pair, right? So this is another application of the pigeonhole principle. So notice the only thing I did here that was very clever is I showed you how you can design subsets that partition A. And by doing it this way, I was able to organize my two sets so I can define a function and I can just invoke the pigeonhole principle. Now, Naturally, when you're using this in applications, you naturally don't, you don't necessarily have to even give the function. We can think about these as objects and containers, because remember, these objects are going to go into any of the containers. It's very arbitrary. So like it's arbitrary for which were the, I, uh, the integers that I pick, for example, they could be in any one of these subsets. But obviously, I pick five distinct numbers, right? So anyways, hopefully that clarifies that. So that's another example here. But I'm going to show you another, another thing to keep in mind. If I take and only and pick four integers instead of five, does there exist from the four pick integers that I picked from A, does there exist a pair such that they sum to nine? The answer, of course, is no. Because we cannot, first, it's worth noting we cannot use the pigeonhole principle because now we have an equal number of objects and containers or equal number of pigeons and pigeonholes. So... If you think about the pigeons and the pigeonholes, the pigeons can fly all into their holes appropriately. There exists some way of doing it. So it's completely possible to put four integers such that they do not satisfy this property. Remember, it's saying it's there must exist such a pair. So if you want to show it's wrong, you just show that there that that there isn't such a pair, right? Like there is no way of. Uh, uh, so there is no such pair. So you just pick four integers and you show that they're, they're, you can't pair them such that they sum to nine. So I'm just going to pick one, two, three, and four. Notice that the largest of these two integers is three and four, which adds to seven, which is, of course, less than nine. So you'll notice that this actually, you cannot in this case, and even worse than that, you can't technically use the pigeonhole principle. So here's another one. This is one I really like, and this is a very popular analogy or example, and it's also a very concrete one that equally is kind of creepy if you think about it. Creepy in a good way. <laughs> so imagine I give you all the residents of Toronto. 
So I'm going to ask you a question. Must there be at least two people with the same number of hairs on their head? I'm going to give you a couple little interesting factoids here. So the population of Toronto is at least 2,930,000 people. It's at least that. Now, if you wanted to know, this is just a fun fact for the day. It doesn't, it's not really a comma torx thing, but it's still a thing. Is the maximum number of hairs on a person's head is less than 300,000. So, that's interesting. So I have my population P, and P is a rather large number. It's much bigger than 300,000. So I'm going to list out in one set my pigeons. Remember, they're not... Pigeons are not people, nor are they pigeon people. Although that's a funny thing to imagine, but no, people of Toronto are not pigeons. <laughs> We're just using that as a descriptor. <laughs> um, so I'm listing out X1, X2, all the way down to X sub P. I'm going to define a function H that is going to tell me um, the number of hairs on their head of the person XI. But guess what? What does this function map to? It maps to the number of possible hairs on their head, which they can have no hairs. They can be like me with some small number of hairs, possibly. Um, or they can be up to 300,000. But notice, but notice, look at this. By the pigeonhole principle, you'll notice that N is much, much bigger than, than 300,000, which is M. Thus, by the pigeonhole principle, there's at least two people with the same number of hairs on their head. Wild, I know, right? You can make all sorts of interesting uh, analogies or comparisons using the pigeonhole principle like this. It's, it's kind of neat. This is why I really like the pigeonhole principle. So I'm going to give you a generalized version. So naturally, you might ask, okay, well, in this example, it's probably very likely that there's actually more than just one, or sorry, there's at least two people. Maybe it's actually more like three or four people. Um, so I want some way of categorizing or allowing me to say something a bit more about the number of people that it could be a, as a lower bound. So in the pigeonhole principle, it says at least two. So it has to be more than one person in this case. I want some way of being able to capture more people. So this is where the generalized pigeonhole principle comes in. So. There's a formal way of describing it with functions. I'm going to focus on the way I was describing it with the pigeons and the pigeonholes, and I'm going to talk about them as items and containers. So it's worth noting that these two things are equivalent to one another. So I'm going to describe the, uh, the, the generalized pigeonhole principle as follows. So if there are n items put into m containers, then at least one container has the floor of n minus 1 over m plus 1 items. So that's what the generalized pigeonhole principle states. And I'm going to give you the proof. And I, I swear it's like, it's really this easy. You're going to use contradiction. So you're going to just assume otherwise. Now, remember the statement of the generalized pigeonhole principle is that if n items can be put into m containers, then at least one container has that many items in it. But well, well when you negate this, it's if n items are put into m containers, then there, then every container has at most, I'm sorry, it, it has at least that many, right? So it has to be at most the floor of n minus one over m plus one minus one. Because remember, I'm taking an inequality there. At least means if I give you the number here, so this is my number here, this is the number of objects in the container. There has to be, there's at least one container that has this many in it. So if I say there are no containers with at least that many, that means there's at most, in every container there has to be at most the floor of n minus 1 over m items in it, right? That's what the negation would tell you, right? I just take the not of at least one container has m, as has uh, the floor of n minus 1 over m plus plus one items in it, right? So, I, so I'm just taking the, the negation of that, which simply is just, hey, look, but that's just simply saying, oh, then then if n items are put into m containers, um, then, so, it, so we have 
So let me reiterate, I'm just getting a little ahead of myself. I'm very excited by this result. It's a very powerful but very simple argument. So if I take the negation, then we know n items are put into n containers and each container has at most the floor of n minus one over m items in it. So you gotta imagine this like a picture. Imagine I have each one of my containers. I have m of these. And I've told you when I assume the negation that each container has at most the floor of n minus one over m items in it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add up all the number of items in my m containers. Each one of the containers has a at most, remember at most, n minus one over m with the floor around it, right? Because remember, we're talking about integers here. They have to be rounded down. So that being said, if I want to add across all the containers, I have to multiply that number. Remember, this is an upper bound on the number of items that are possibly going to be in the containers. So it's going. the upper bound on this is going to be at most m times that number. Well, okay, well, what's... Well, what's bigger than the floor of n minus 1 over m? Well, okay, it's just n minus 1 over m, right? So you can use this inequality that I have invoked right here. This one right here. So you'll notice here that this inequality holds because of the definition of the floor. Um, but it's worth noting that whenever you round down integers being divided like this, you know that it's going to be at least the size of it without the floor there, right? Because we're not rounding down anymore. Now it's just the number itself. You always have to be very careful when you're dealing with the floor or the ceiling. In this case, we're okay. Um, so I just take m times that. Well, okay, well, look, I have m times something where the denominator of the other term is m. So I just cancel out the m's. And now I end up with, e it's going to equal n minus 1, which is less than n. Oopsie daisy. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, well, remember, the number of items is n, but remember, we're, so we have it where the maximum, so the total number of items is at most n minus 1, but there are actually n items. So there are both n minus 1 items at most, and there are n items. Thus, we arrive at a contradiction. Because these are right these you can't reconcile these two things they're contradictory statements because we know there's n items but there's also but but are we derived that there's n minus one items at most um anyways it's a beautifully simple argument that's the point that's what makes this very fascinating and keep in mind this generalizes over the pigeonhole principle so i want to show you how you can use this this will be the final example here so if i give you a group of 85 people I'm going to ask you, do there, do at least four of the people have the same first letter for their last name? So remember, all, if we're talking about the English alphabet, if I look at people's last names or family names, their, the first letter of their last name has to be one of 26 letters. And there are 85 people, each with a last name. So keep in mind, we're excluding people like Cher. <laughs> I don't know if Cher technically has a last name. I have no idea. We're just excluding these people. To be, just for the sake of this example. Don't hurt me. <laughs> so, so I apologize to anybody that's a Cher fan. But I'm just I'm just joking around. So the point I'm getting at is like um is that there are, so we're making the assumption that there are 85 people each with a last name, and there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Therefore, by the pigeonhole principle, at least the floor of 85 minus 1 over 26 plus 1, if I simplify the floor there, I end up with 3 plus 1, which equals 4. So by the generalized pigeonhole principle, four people must have the same first letter for their last name. So the answer, of course, is yes. So you can use this idea in all sorts of different settings. Um, very often, uh, at least from, there's two different standpoints you can come from here. Very often the pigeonhole principle can be used to generate lower bounds. If you're trying to count up a number of objects that could be possibly put into bins. Or imagine you have gumballs you're counting and you want to distribute them into bins. 
or you imagine you have a bunch of machines that need to get scheduled and you have a bunch of jobs that have all the same length and you need to distribute them across the machines, the pigeonhole principle can be used to derive a lower bound on how many objects must at least be in one of these bins or objects or these machines. It's a very powerful idea. And you can use this idea to extend to other combinatorial ideas. If you find a lot of these ideas interesting, um, if say you're interested in more taking more mathematics classes, a combinatorics class would probably talk much more about this or give it more treatment. Uh, depending on what kind of subject it might be in computer science, you may encounter some of these ideas as well. So either way, the pigeonhole principle is very fascinating. Um, hopefully you thought it was very fascinating too. So I'm going to stop it right here. I want to say thank you very much for your time and have yourself a beautiful day.